You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to a very interesting episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. And I'm Josh Baker. And you're going to have a lot of fun as you listen to today's show. We're going to be talking about the Lance or LANC system. You've heard me say it before. This is the system where you can get instantaneous airspace authorization to fly your drone. But it's not as seamless as it was once promised. So today we're going to be going over that and so much more. When should you use Lance? When is it a good idea? When is it a bad idea? What do you have to consider? All that and more in today's episode. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, today's show is brought to you by our friends and family of the Drone U community. If you're not a part of the largest drone training community where people are staying constantly engaged and on top of this ever moving and ever dynamic technology, it grows so fast it's almost impossible to stay on top of it. But when you're inside the Drone U community and you have access to over 34 classes, it becomes a lot easier. Drone U is going to be also adding multiple classes and also we're going to be adding more and more ways to really see who are our best pilots so we can farm out work to them as so many people are asking us for that information already. So look out for that and more. If you're not a member, you're gonna wanna join today. Go to droneu.education and don't wait because the value builds every day. I'm part 107, and I, but I've never found any exact instructions on how one utilizes this LANC or LANC system for pre-approvals. Is there one particular program to use that's better than others? Uh, is this supposed to be used in any controlled airspace? Do I need to get approval prior to arriving on site, or can it be done on site at the time I'm flying? Sometimes I get a cannot fly message because I'm too close to an airport. Does this system work in that situation? And if so, how do I get my UAV unlocked so I can fly once I do receive permission? Uh, anyway, I'm just looking for some clarification on how to use this system the best, as I haven't really seen any clear-cut instructions online anywhere. And it uh, looks like a good system, but I, I just don't really know how to go about utilizing it. Thank you. Thanks for all what you guys do. It's always very helpful information. Well, that was very nice. I'm grateful for that question. Um, it's a good question. So three-part question. Uh, what do I use to get uh, Lance authorizations? How much time do I need to consider? And what happens when I fire up my drone and I still have authorization, but I'm getting a no-fly? So. First things first, where can you get Lance authorization? Well, what's your favorite app? Um, actually, I go, to, I go to this thing right here. Oh, really? And uh, Is that to, your mobile telephone? That is my mobile device. Wow. And uh, get on there and I go to Kitty Hawk. Actually. Gosh, the suspense was building on that one. Kitty Hawk is what I used to. I was just wondering which app uh, you like to use. So I will uh, actually go ahead and fire up my Kitty Hawk right now because here's the thing, guys. Right now, we are actually in an area where a TFR just populated. We know that there's a TFR in this area. I want to see if it populates. Um, it looks like it is pulling up the class Bravo airspace that we are just outside of at IAD. And you can also see, oh, there's the TFR. Boom. And you can actually see here if on my screen, if you're watching on YouTube, that you know high variance of wind gusts, it's 50 degrees outside, visibility is 8.6 miles, cloud cover is 58% at 3,409 feet AGL, and GPS quality signal is really good. Density altitude is minus 229 feet. That's really good information. In fact, I think it's actually one of the best apps that really kind of pulls in all the best information from different sources. I really, really like it. It's actually one of two applications where you can get Lance approval. The other application I believe is through DJI Pilot or DJI Flight Hub. I can't remember what it is. Um, that is for quote unquote commercial users. Not really sure how they differentiate between commercial and non-commercial, but that's not really important. What's important is that Kitty Hawk just launched the Lance um, access for free. So you used to have to pay, uh, what was it, like five bucks? Or uh, I think it was like 10, 10 or 10, 15, 10 bucks 10 a month? 15, yeah. So you used to have to pay a monthly fee to be able to have access to this, but now you don't have to do that. So I recommend you download the Kitty Hawk application and check it out today. Now, 
The second question was, what type of considerations do I need to, you know, kind of take advantage of, or do I need to consider what things am I thinking about? What do I need, you know, just so much information. Well, okay, first thing is first. Lance is used typically on big airports that are approved in the Lance system. There are a lot of small airports that are not in the Lance system. So if you go into Kitty Hawk, or maybe you wanna use a desktop application like Skyward or, um, oh man, there's a couple other ones. Um, they have funky names. Uh, anyway, not important. What is important is if you use a desktop application or Kitty Hawk and you notice that the airport is not available to actually apply for a Lance authorization, chances are that you typically would have to get an airspace authorization online to be able to fly in that airspace. Which and that's actually gonna take a little bit. I just actually had to do that for, for Houston because uh, Houston Hobbies not on the Lance system. And that was because they were having issues. The dual, dual airspace. Gotcha. So there are a lot of reasons why different airports are not on the Lance system. I know with DFW and Dallas Executive, there was an issue with the UASFM maps, which is Unmanned Aerial Systems Facility Maps, which essentially showcases airspace for drones in particular areas. Now, a lot of those maps are based off of old GIS systems and have significant errors. Even where we're sitting today, literally where we're sitting today on the UAS FM map, it says that we're in a 400 grid zone and we have to apply for access to that. No, we don't. We're out of class. Yeah, we're outside of class B. This is why it's so important for all of you to be watching information on airspace. There's a reason that we at Drone U brought in Ted Wilson, a certified flight instructor who had been teaching airspace for United Airlines for almost 20 years. He was the voice in your head if you ever listened to one of those safety briefings on a United flight from like 1990 to 2008. I mean, he did that for a long time. The thing is, is that what Ted does is he has created ways to remember the airspace so that you can quickly remember it yourself. And you'll also learn how to read sectional maps and sectional maps are really the key information for airspace, where you can fly, where you can't fly. There have been so many times where all the apps have failed me, the information has been bad, and I have to go to the sectional map to actually figure out where I can fly. And where we're sitting today is another perfect example of that. By going to skyvector.com, we can easily pull up our location and know that we are actually outside of the airspace. Well, even on Kitty Hawk, you know, Kitty Hawk has has sectionals built into it. And so, I mean, even now I'll pull up Kitty Hawk and see where I'm, you know, you can see where your pin's pulling up on the sectional. And uh, That's actually really helpful because AirNav really and tool. a lot of other ones don't do that. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a really good tool. Very, very helpful. So depending on the airspace, the time consideration can change. If it is a Lance approval, I would still recommend doing it ahead of time, even a week, just to ensure that there's no issues. If it's a non-Lance airport, sadly, you may have to wait up to 90 days, but the FAA has been getting a little bit faster. Frankly, if I were you, want, you wanna fast track that whole process, I would fill out the airspace authorization through the Drone Zone portal on the FAA website. Once you're completed with that, I would send a copy of that um, airspace application to the local air traffic controller and try to get faster access to that controlled airspace. Now understand too that you're getting access to controlled airspace, not restricted airspace. If you're flying in restricted airspace, that's a whole new thing. You cannot fly there. That's DOD airspace, that's military airspace along the border and so much more. Now his other question was, uh, let's see, he talked about considerations for time, which there's not really a clear system. If the airport is Lance author, uh, authorized, you can go through the app. If it's not, you're going through the drone zone portal. And there are even, there are even airports where you're gonna have a really hard time even with that. And uh, uh, the example is, is Sedona, even though it's in class G airspace and you don't need an authorization. Yeah, it's actually not a good example, but I just wanted to throw Sedona out there one more time because it's, uh, it finally made some big news magazine, I forgot what it was, where they were talking about Sedona's in class G, but the signs around the airport completely counteract with like federal law. And it was just like, finally, people are like getting the hint. Um, I'm trying to remember his last question. Oh, it was about um, if you are, let's say you get the authorization to fly, but your drone says you're too close to the airport, what can you do? We actually have an entire video online um, it's on the drone you site, so if it's free to members, and it shows you exactly how to go through the process of unlocking a red zone. 
it's actually a very interesting process and more complicated than I ever thought, which is why we did a video on it. Not the highest quality video, but it gives you everything you need to know in order to get that red zone unlocked. Now, DJI did just launch Geo 2.0, so you're actually seeing that some areas are uh, more open and some areas are actually more closed. So if you're on an approach path or if you're on a takeoff path, then typically you could really have more difficulty. So if you haven't updated your birds, chances are they're not running on Geo 2.0. Um, if you have updated your birds, they are probably on Geo 2.0. You can also pull that up on the DJI website to check it out because now, I mean, this guy's figuring out, it's really a two-step process, right? We have to get FAA authorization to fly in an area and then unlock our birds to fly in that same and area. You have to get DJI authorization. Well, that was kind of the second part, right? Yeah. With the DJI authorization. Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping that someday they will just be like unique and let all commercial users with a million points or more on their accounts to just unlock their birds. Like right. it would really be nice. Considering also, didn't, didn't the uh, Supreme Court just pass too that when we buy technology, we own it. We're not leasing it, right? So this whole geofencing thing really is one of those touchy, sticky it, subjects. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely has its uses, but... Totally. And can definitely be a pain. Definitely. Well, guys, hope that answers your question today. Look, the Lance system and how to gain access to controlled airspace has gotten a little bit muddied up since the system isn't super clear. And we have a lot of old geriatric ATC guys who are not allowing the Lance system to work. I'm not sure why, as uh, it's pretty clear with National Park System that by not having a clear permitting process, they're having more and more violations of airspace. Yeah. Shocker. Huh. Weird. Well, anyway, that is going to do it for us today, guys. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you have a question, go to askadroneu.com. Upload your question. We want to hear it. And also, a big shout out to everyone who is joining our NTSB Accident Scene Reconstruction class. And good news, we found out today we're going to be having another one. That's as long as uh, we don't screw it up for you guys. So uh, we'll be on our best behavior. And on that bombshell, that's going to do it for us today. My name is Paul. And I'm Rob. I mean, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for us today. Thanks again for watching. See you next time. <laughs>